Oh, say like no. Program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence, which really, really like it's something that always sounded good to me. And the reason is like we can use uh, real world examples like this one. So this is what's the implementation of the binary search in the actual JDK code. And it, this was like this for pretty much, uh, I think uh, be like this for nine years. And someone actually figured it out in 2006, the actual JDK bug has a bug. Uh, the binary search uh, has a bug. And have you seen the line in red? Uh, it's a case of overflow. And it took literally nine years uh, someone to find it. So the question is like, you know, can we catch this type of bugs if there is a way to actually do that? So in some way, yes. And that's, uh, that's all about what property-based testing is. And property-based testing is from high level. It's just, instead of doing example-based testing, you, you test the behavior or like uh, it's about the specification of your behavior. And we can actually make it much more clearer as uh, we go. And the idea is instead of uh, generating the input data, you let the, the computer or the algorithms generate for you, which kind of like uh, great if you want to catch the subtle and edge cases box. So when to use PBT, uh, we have few patterns or motivations when you want to do fuzzing, when the test structure has like a symmetry, uh, when we want to uh, assess or validate some invariance, and when actual our code is either potent, so we can assess some properties about those, those property uh, about the system. And so I let continue Gokul. And, uh... Cool. Hey, thanks, Vanda. So hi, I'm Gokul. Uh, so these are like four of the patterns that are present uh, when you know, you're doing the property based testing. The first one is, you know, the fuzzy. Uh, essentially, this is where you, you want to test server from proxy servers, API endpoints, maybe even function input validation, right? Um, next slide, please. So here's one of the functions from the monolith, right? So this is a function that tries to abbreviate a string. Essentially, we give it a very long string and it tries to trim it to a certain length and add, you know, the dot, dot, dot at the end of it. Now, if you look at the test, for this particular method. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward test and it looks fairly complete too, right? So it's a parameterized test where, you know, we're giving it a set of arguments to expect and it looks like it covers most of the edge cases. There's a null, there's an empty string, you know, there's the same length string, spaces, all of, all of the above. But is this really a complete test, right? Now the same test written in a property-based test way looks like this because the method definition takes a string or an integer. We say, given any string, given any integer, once we truncate it, the length of the truncated string must be less than or equal to the input length, right? That's a property. And the same way uh, for any string and a positive integer, right? And this way of writing tests uh, seems a little counterintuitive at first, but it's actually more complete. How exactly is that the, uh, like, the framework that we're using to test takes any arbitrary string, any arbitrary positive integer and gives it an input and tests whether the property holds true. Now, the output of this test really is this. So what happens is that a negative integer is passed, which is a fairly possible case, right? If this method is being called in a chain of a lot of functions, it is possible that somewhere something can go wrong and a negative integer can be passed and that's something that's not being caught by that code and this helps catch that. And even the most basic case where, you know, we take like a four character string. And if you notice the code, we were actually doing max length minus five, right? And that would actually fail as well. So this method would only hold for certain lengths of strings. And that's what's actually caught by the property based test. Now, the next category is symmetry. Now this is a fairly common pattern, right? It's Serialization, deserialization, essentially inverse or mirror operations. Uh, cryptography, databases, it's all fairly, a very fairly common pattern. Now, 
the first example here is we're trying to create an in-memory repository and we're going to just read our writes, right? So if you look here, we have a user repository that just has two functions, one called save, one called read. And what we're trying to do here is uh, we're just trying to say, hey, if I save a user and I read the same user back, it should be the user that I try to save initially, right? Um, and this is a this is a fairly easy way of testing uh, your 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 methods in in the repository. And, and, and another example here, right? In symmetry, is uh, oh sorry, can you go back there? Uh, and this is how we generate the user essentially. So we say that a user in our scope of testing is just an object with a UUID for the ID and a string for the name. And that's how we define it, right? Because a user who is actually in real life could put whatever name as the input. So that's how we are generating a user and you know, thereby we're getting a random user and not like what we think a user would look like. Um, another example for symmetry would be uppercase to lowercase, right? So if I say, hey, I'll take a string, I convert it to uppercase, I convert it back to lowercase, it should be the same as just converting it to lowercase. And if you look carefully at this example, you've actually restricted the cache to Armenia, right? And that's really, we, we are starting off in Armenia, so that's actually a valid real life use case. And if you look at this, the property test actually fails because there are certain characters in the Armenian cache that don't really convert cleanly from uppercase and lowercase. And this is something that catches, that, that is caught by this test, right? Um, the next kind of pattern here is the invariance. So essentially this is the common mapping or transformation that we always do between services and between controllers in, in the monolith, where you know we, we are taking a list or something and we're transforming it. And essentially we want to ensure that the transformation did not really modify the contents of the list in, in, in a large way. Maybe it did not filter out something or you know something less. So, uh, essentially, we should measure a property before the transformation, after the transformation, and the it should be the same. And the easiest example really is that you take a list, we sort the list, the size should be the same as the input list. But it's a very easy pattern to do. Um, the next one uh, really is the item potency, right? Now, given that Glovo has an event-based system, I, I assume that most of you are fairly aware about item potency, right? We perform the same operation multiple times. It does not result in a drastic change after the first time. That's essentially item potency, right? So uh, apart from events, we also use item potency in normalization when we escape characters for URL encoding and things like that. And here's, an, uh, here's a good example from the monolith where we're trying to round a double, right? And if you look at this, it seems fairly harmless, right? The, the first one takes a box value, it's really just rounding it to two decimal places in the first function and in the section on, uh, and in the second function we're actually giving it a list of places and it's you know just rounding it half out. It seems fairly complete, right? But however, if you look carefully, there are cases that these are not handled, right? And here's the property based test for the same. Thing. We just say that if we round multiple times, it results in the same number, right? So we just say round of round of the same number the same as rounding it one time. And the same thing for the ones with the places. We say, given an arbitrary double, given a non-negative integer between zero and 15, if we round it twice, it should be the same thing. But does it work? It doesn't. Because if you look at the error in the test, if we pass in a double dot infinite or a double not a number, it's going to fail. In the first function, it might not because multiplying it by 100 would result in zero, but in the second function, when we create a big decimal out of the not a number, it does not work, right? Um, next, we go to generators and shrinking. So this is, a very, this is more of the property-based framework, right? So the first question you're going to have is, okay, hey, I wrote a property-based test. How do I give input or how do I tell the framework to generate inputs to it? Right? And that's where the generator comes in. So a generator is just a, a, a thing that's responsible for providing values as input to the property-based test in itself. Right? It's, think of it as a stream of values. Now, the generator in itself can be of two types. One that's arbitrary and one that's exhaustive. 
And in all of the examples that we were showing earlier, it's all arbitrary, right? Um, so the first, first type is the arbitrary generator. And what this actually does is it looks at all the edge cases, which is, you know, max, min, zero, one, minus one, null, et cetera. And it, and it also gives like sample values. So if I say integer, it's going to say integer max value, integer min value, zero, one, minus one, maybe a couple of integers that are positive, a couple of integers that, that are negative. So this kind of balances out that your test does not run for two hours just to test the whole integer space, right? It samples a certain set, including edge cases, and lets you use that for your tests. And so After this, good, have... yeah, so that's a good point. So normally uh, the examples you've seen until now, the core test by default generates a thousand samples, which includes uh, the edge cases and the edge cases are probabilistic. So it, they might get all of them, but you can, uh, are all configurable. So you can configure how many samples you want to generate. You can also do it by generating just a single sample. Obviously in that case, the probability of you hitting the edge cases is uh, nearly zero. But it is all configurable, and most of the frameworks of uh, property-based uh, testing have these features where you can configure how much, how many you want to generate, and uh, what's the probability of you wanting to update edge cases. Sorry. Yep. No, thank you so much, Fanta. That's like a really good point. Uh, so coming to the next kind where someone would actually want to have every single value that's present in the sample space. So that's an exhaustive generator, and where would you really use it? Like enums. That's like the classic example for an exhaustive generator, right? So you have like 20 distinct values in the enum, you want to use it, that's the best way, right? You could even use it for, if you if you know the range of values, that's another case for exhaustive. And that's only, you know, you you'd only use it when you want to be fairly complete about the range. Otherwise, you're most probably going to be using the arbitrary generator instead. Um, so, the next thing that we can do with generators, right? And we've, we've been looking at primitive generators is that it's composable, right? So uh, the generators, you can combine multiple generators to form fairly complex types, right? Uh, case in point was how we were generating a user. We used two generators for a UUID and a string and combined it to form a user. You could also do fairly other complex things like combinatorics, right? You could have uh, an arbitrary generator that generates a permutation or a combination of a certain set of inputs, right? Maybe even an email. Um, so here's a really good example of how we can compose it. So the first one, right, uh, is this is, you know, uh, generators to generate stuff for HTTP testing, right? So you have headers, you have cookies, you have the HTTP methods, and then, you know, you want to have a non-empty set, you want to have an empty string, a request, a response, metadata, et cetera, right? So these are generators that we can create once and reuse in multiple places for generating metadata, for generating, you know, a sample HTTP request, et cetera. So, so just to summarize, Generators uh, are given by the framework. A lot of the frameworks do provide generators out of the box, but you can compose the generators to build more complex generators for your users, right? That's the idea here. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is shrinking, right? So as the framework tests, so what the framework is going to do is it will take a function, it's going to give an input, right? It'll pass. The next input, it'll pass. The next input, it'll fail. and we don't know how much we overshot the boundary by, right? So let's say we have a function that fails at the input of integer 200. 100 would pass, 150 would pass, then we say 1000 and it fails. So we don't know if the boundary happened at 1000 or at 200 or at 800, wherever, right? So a shrinker is actually a component that reduces the scope of that input given. So a shrinker, for example, if you give it a large string, the shrinker would shrink that string into a smaller string that could be again provided as, as input. So a string could, could have less characters, less duplication. Maybe if we give it a list, it would remove the first element or the last element, make maybe half it in size, et cetera, right? And here's shrinking in action, right? So the uppercase and lowercase example that we took, so it actually failed for this huge Armenian string, like that, that, that's at least 40 characters, right? But if you look at what the framework's doing, it's actually trying to shrink it. And it, it, it looks like binary search to be, to be honest, right? 
it tries to half it first and check if it passes or fails. And when it fails, it keeps going again and again and again. And finally arrives at saying, hey, this is the character that's actually causing this test to fail. So this would this is actually a very pointed example to say, hey, this character causes the test to fail rather than this huge string and letting the engineer figure out, hey, what's this, the character in this thing that's causing it to fail, right? So that's the, this is one of like the, the big advantages of using property-based tests and the frameworks actually help you with it. So it keeps decreasing the input scope until it gives you the pointed example as to where it is. Um, so conclusions, Panta, I'll let you handle this. So uh, obviously for the time given, uh, even just talking about the shrinkers would take like half an hour because there are two types of like uh, the way to do shrinkings. Some people actually do the research on that one. So the, just to conclude, uh, property-based testing helps you, even if you don't use property-based testing as, as a whole, uh, you can use some of the features from it, for example, the generators. So even if you don't write uh, thousands of like uh, randomized testings, you can use the generators to generate a user or a customer or uh, whatever entity you have in your project. And instead of, I think most of the times in the Java world, we tend to create uh, like you know, the object matters or like a, a factory for the tests. And probably those tests are always with some data art coded. And it is quite interesting, actually, the randomizing those uh, values, those inputs, because the, we, we're going to start catching edge cases we don't even uh, thought about it in the beginning. Uh, obviously, there is no free lunch on uh, anything. Uh, the fact that you're running uh, five tests versus the thousands, let's make a difference. Obviously, it's going to make uh, the test uh, very slow. And uh, the second one, which is like, can people can see it like a positive or negative way, is that your test might be end up flaky until it's probably fixed properly. So, which means like uh, on one run, on the first uh, thousand tests, uh, your uh, your thing passes, you go into production, uh, or like you on the build system, on the build system gonna fail because that will gonna be like a different set of a thousand tests. Um, so obviously there are uh, cases where you can actually fix the, uh, the values uh, because they are random uh, ra random value generators and are controlled by the seed value that you can hard code the seed value. So for example, if some test fail for a specific uh, seed, you can hard code that seed in your test and try to fix the problem. Uh, obvi like obviously those patterns are uh, some of them. There are a lot of that you can apply. There are use cases where uh, uh, your system is uh, more uh, has states there are state transitions you can write properties for that so the uh, the big thing is like focus on the properties and definitely invest in generators uh, because it's going to make uh, even if you are building an api you can expose your generators to others and you can use it without like the client need to build uh, specific uh, entities for obviously for uh, more type systems like Scala and uh, Kotlin, if you have like data class or uh, seal classes or classes in uh, case classes in Scala, like most of the, these uh, tools can auto-generate you the random value. Mm. So obviously there are cases in Java, like I don't know if people know about like, you no, know, there are tools like fakers that can actually like, you know, generate some data, some fake data for emails, like user IDs, but those are probably uh, more hard coded. Some are like uh, randomized, but property best is the, the feature. The base feature is actually how we randomize the tests. If you guys have any questions, we are happy to take. Uh, thank you. Thank you a lot for this presentation. It's super good. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, but uh, we will also wait. Uh, I will make the questions only to I believe, and then we will wait for the Q and A. Uh, please, uh, we have the Q and A. Write questions to to our colleagues. Otherwise, if you don't remember an anything now, you have also the the Slack channel where you can uh, after the the session also put questions. So I think it this is a really good idea. Um, I only have I would say two concerns. Um, Maybe we can, of course, we can apply 
all these all the, these idea in all our tests we can do it but my question maybe we should only for or at least at the beginning trying to apply for maybe some algorithms imagine the binary search we know that if we test one or two cases it's not going to be complete and to to complete or to have a, a complete test we need to test almost all the domain and that is uh, it's impossible we don't we don't have time i think it's uh, it's, it will take a lot of time for sure. And in my opinion, I think this is really good, but I would say applying this type of algorithms or functions because most of our tests, I would say that they are, imagine you have a string, it's null or not null, and, and it has a, a small size, uh, a, a certain size. Uh, another question that I have is the, um, about the generators. I saw that you have the edge cases the normal ones, like when the string is null or empty, but maybe you also have your business edge cases. In that case, we can create our own generator, right? Yes. And then we can compose them in a way that's more complete. complete. Yes, yes. Like the only generators are like composable. So here, okay. like, no, the, you can create any, the base ones like non empty string are like a, like a stream of data. So you can filter, map, uh, fold them, the way the uh, your system works so yeah i i agree in one side like on the going back to your first questions mm -hmm. uh, uh, i have that like no see so when uh, i start using the property bed testing i was more like ah, what is this but i ended up always writing property based testing so always try to actually find out the properties to test because that confidence of the things uh, gives me like you no know, the data that i didn't even even consider so, and uh, seeing failing for those use cases and going and actually asking the business, actually, is this a case? Like uh, this should have been like, no, for example, that uh, the upper casing and lower casing is like a good example. Like, no, we, it works for ASCII characters. So like, no, are we uh, only using ASCII characters? Uh, so overall, uh, I start, even if I, when there are cases where we don't write like the full property-based testing, like I use the generators to generate this random data and like makes uh, makes the, the test much more solid because of the hard sometimes like, you know, it, the implementation works for uh, one thing, it doesn't work for uh, others. But these, as you said, the algorithms, like I uh, know the example you said, like everything that is like symmetric uh, works like this one. Like uh, most of the times, this is actually, if you have some constraints on databases, uh, automatically gonna find it out. Uh, this is like actually simplistic one, obviously in the real use cases, probably the, the user ID is in, like set by the database and you have to apply if the user ID is actually set. So I think thinking separately as a more, instead of as example, thanks like, you know, with this input, I get this output, talking about more the properties, uh, I, I thought it gave me more uh, more ways to make the test fails. This is actually the beauty of it. It's not focused on the making it pass it. The beauty of it is like it's focused on making it fail. So also that that it is changed. But yeah, I think as a starting point, probably people need to use it on the, like on the examples we showed. I have one one follow up question, and then we have already one question in the the Q and A. Yeah. So, in, in your experience, imagine um, if we are going to to microservices, our code base will be smaller comparing to the monolithic, of course. Yeah. And adding this type of tests will increase the test phase, right? Yeah. And, and my question for you is this: This is um, we can apply this in microservices, but in a, in a huge monolithic, imagine that everybody's going to have this. How much do you think is going to increase? Of course, we are going I, to say it depends on the generator also and the amount of the domain that we are going to test, right? Uh, absolutely. Like there is no like there is no solution that fits all. Like in the okay. monolith, I see like now, uh, obviously, we are okay. a different okay. list. So. Okay, good. Let's, uh, let's go for the Q&A. Uh, can you access the Q&A? Yeah, yeah, this one. Can, can you read it, please? Uh, so everybody. Yeah, can. this is from Luca. And so, like, how does this fit uh, with TDD in your opinion? Uh, that's actually uh, great questions. I, at least for me, uh, they're complementary. So, uh, TDD, I think maybe we need another talk on TDD. Like, uh, TDD for me was like a design 
like that the uh, instead of development so i use tdd like the the london london ones where i use tdd to actually design and try to find out the interaction between components and i wouldn't use it like to assess uh, if something is valid or not so i think tdd will gonna help you like you no know, come up with a properly like uh, encapsulated properly uh, decoupled components and i would use a uh, property best testing to actually have the test at scale so for all the inputs that it's, the problem is always been like like you no know, even with tdd like you no know, the inputs you gave it's like you no know, it's you and uh, we are kind of like biased on the inputs uh, we want i think obviously like there are great people who come up with with like some contrived inputs that assess properly their system but uh, i'm too lazy to do that and just to add to the test time uh, conversation we had earlier right? it is possible to configure the amount of iterations or the amount of random seed data based on what pipeline you are running right so if you want to be fairly certain like locally you could have like a sample size of 2000 so locally when you are testing you could test it out but then you if you are fairly confident of that in in development or when you're going to production, you could decrease the sample size to make your pipelines a little faster. So you can trade off. It's not like it's always going to be slow when we're generating random. You can have a balance there. Yes. And uh, on top of that, when the actually uh, that was like a, for event driven uh, architecture where you have to create like, a, I don't know, some uh, quite high number of events that put. So I used quite a lot interacting with Kafka. And uh, if you have like a producer and consumer, so instead of like, you no, know, when you start having like, I want a thousand messages, it's really difficult to like, you know, to, and the generators, you can actually easily create uh, a lot of these events and push them to Kafka and whatever assess some properties uh, on the consumer side. Okay. So okay. it is, as I said, there is no free lunch. You no, know, it's gonna, test gonna definitely be slow. Obviously, you are not running one, you're gonna have running thousands. And uh, obviously, it's going to be flaky because the test that uh, even if it passes on your uh, uh, on your machine, it might fail on someone else's machine because of the the randomized nature. Nature. Okay. Uh, I think we don't have for now more questions in the Q and A. But don't forget, we have the Lightning Talks Q and A channel. You can go ahead and put it there. I, I think the presenters will have uh, the pleasure to answer all your your questions. Uh, thank you once again for this. Uh, amazing presentation the topic it's very very good uh so for the rest of the team see you next week for a, another lightning talk session thank you thank you for